All right, well, um, we're glad that you're joining us one way or another. If you're on our First Baptist Church Alito uh, website, or if you're on Facebook, or uh, WRMJ 510 uh, Sunday night, um, any way that you're joining us, we're glad that you're here. I want to just kind of catch you up a little bit. Uh, if this is your first time with us, or if you are um, just joining us through the the quarantine, or maybe your longtime you know attender of First Baptist, whatever the case may be. A um, couple of things that are going on. Obviously, we don't have a ton of announcements um, because everything is kind of postponed and canceled for the time being. But uh, in two weeks, we do have a, a special event called Mother's Day, and we're still going to celebrate Mother's Day. And so one of the things that we want you to know is that if you go to firstbaptistalito.com, um, we have a special event that we're going to do for Mother's Day, and I'm not going to go into all the detail of it. Go to our website, check it out, and uh, there's something special that we want to do to bless our community, bless our families, bless our church, and so uh, join us for that. And, uh, and this is also a good reminder for husbands and kids. Uh, Mother's Day is in two weeks, don't forget. Um, and then also we are doing something uh, special for our community called a scavenger hunt, love your community. And so we have uh, some uh, packets out in front of the church. If you want to grab one of those, it'll tell you kind of how to go through the scavenger hunt. And what that is, is if you participate as an individual or family and you post it onto Facebook and let us know that you completed it, uh, then we will donate $10 to the uh, Mercer County Food Pantry. So it's fun for you, and it's a win for our community, and uh, everything involved in it is either fun or it's helpful to people in need. So I just want to invite you to, to participate in that. It's posted on Facebook. I believe it's on our website as well. So a lot of ways to get involved there. Um, and as we kind of move forward, I want to let you know that uh, we've been through this series for the last uh, six weeks, you know, Fearless Faith, and uh, we've been really diving into some characters of the Bible and how to have a fearless faith in times of trouble. Um, and so now we're going to move back into the series that I started a few months ago uh, through First and Second Thessalonians. And so uh, we're going to be dealing with, for the next two weeks, the return of Christ. Um, and so if you didn't join us uh, for that, or maybe you're new to the church, or you're just like everybody else, and that was so long ago that, you know, you're kind of having a hard time remembering, you know, where we've been, uh, I want to spend today kind of wrapping that up and catching you up and to kind of uh, reiterate a few things that we've talked about so that we can move right into Second Thessalonians. Um, and so... What we need to remember about uh, the books, First and Second Thessalonians, is that they were intensely um, interested in the return of Christ. And Paul uh, deals with the return of Christ in every chapter through those two books. And so what happens is that we have to kind of understand why that is, and one of the reasons why is because of the situation that they were in. It was a little different than what we're dealing with, but it was similar in the sense that it was a very difficult, painful, confusing time uh, in their life. And so Paul, if you remember back what was going on with him, he went to Thessalonica and he be began to preach the gospel. People got saved and he began to build a church. He was there for a few weeks, maybe a few months uh, there's a little bit of uh, discussion about how long he was there, but not long. He wasn't there very long. And then a uh, aggressive and rampant persecution broke out against him personally and against the church uh, to the extent that he had to leave basically in the middle of the night and escape with his life. And as he escapes with his life, what happens is that the uh, people who are persecuting him follow him to the next town, and they are after him, wanting to kill him, and, and he has to flee again. And so he's kind of running away from uh, the Thessalonican people uh, for a while because they are so uh, hateful towards him and his message. And so as Paul, you know, flees, and he leaves this small, um, new immature church in Thessalonica, he's concerned about their faith and how they're doing because there is still going to be persecution in Thessalonica while he's gone and he finds out that they're actually doing pretty well. Uh, in their faith, they've, they've trusted the Lord, they're persevering, even though things are 
tough. They're continuing in their walk with the Lord. They are trusting him through uh, the continued, aggressive, rampant persecution that they're dealing with. And so he begins to write them letters to help them to continue through that time of persevering in that time of, of persecution. And so one of the things that happens is as they are dealing with this sense of um, turmoil because of the persecution that is continuing to go on in their life, they get intensely interested in uh, the return of Christ. That seems to be where they place all their hope is that this life isn't that great. Um, We don't have a lot of hope for what's going on around us. So they're perspective was, we just want Jesus to return, and they were fearful that maybe he had already returned, and they missed it, and what's going to happen, and all those things, and so Paul begins to write to them about uh, their faith, and how to continue, and how to know uh, that they can trust that Jesus is going to return, they won't miss it, um, and that it, it, it is the hope of the church. And so that's where we're going to kind of uh, plunge in. We're actually in Second Thessalonians chapter Two, and uh, we're going to just read a few verses. And here's what we want to do: we don't, we're not going to dive into all the mystery surrounding the times and the days and the, all the events that are going to uh, precede the return of Christ. But what we want to do is to understand uh, the need for the return of Christ, uh, the absolute confidence that we have that He will return, and the fact that what His return is going to do is going to restore and not only restore he's going to uh, complete his ministry that he began uh, when he came the first time and so uh, we're going to deal with kind of the nature of why it's important that the church understand and believe and expect the return of christ okay so second thessalonians 2 1 through 3 says this says concerning the coming of our lord jesus christ and our being gathered to him we ask you brothers not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until, and I kind of wanted to stop there and just say until dot, 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 uh, but I'll complete the, the verse here. Until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Uh, but what we want to do is really focus in on, he, he's not going to return until, but he is going to definitely return. And so, Father, thank you that you've given us some great promises and wonderful hope. Uh, Lord, and, and even in this time, Father, we know that we are being given uh, a time uh, to reflect and remember and understand that uh, our home uh, is heaven and that uh, our destiny is better than our current experience and that the things that we're dealing with now, Lord, um, are really a, just a, a something we persevere through uh, because of uh, the hope that we have that, that you're going to bring about greater things. Now, we know and we believe and, and we understand, Lord, that you are going to do some great things through this time to restore uh, some people to you uh, who have been wandering. You're going to win some people to you who've never known you. You're going to build the faith of your church, Lord, who is at this time uh, just pouring out their hearts in prayer and desire for you, Father. I I believe and know and and I ask uh, that you would continue to do great work in and through this, Lord. But we also know that this is a time to get the message of the gospel out to as many people as possible, uh, that your kingdom would grow, and that when your kingdom is established, Lord, fully and completely, uh, Lord, that we will rejoice in it. And so thank you that uh, we get to be included in that through simple faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the work that you did to make that possible in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, I want to take a step back to Uh, one of the things that really is dear to my heart, which is the fact that uh, when I came to know Christ, um, it was a personal uh, sense of the presence of Jesus in my life. And and it was kind of a reminder of uh, where I had been when I was a child. When I was a, a little kid, I remember distinctly, and I don't know how many people have this similar experience but uh, I remember distinctly feeling and sensing and, and knowing uh, God personally and Jesus Christ personally when I was 
four or five years old, I remember that being very, very distinct personal relationship. And through my uh, teenage years, I wandered and I strayed and I went my own way. And I know a lot of people have that similar experience. I've talked to so many folks that uh, they grew up in church and they wandered and they came back in their adult life to the Lord. Uh, through friends, through um, some other means of, of God waking them up to their need for him. And so that was my experience as well. I had kind of known the Lord when I was a kid. I had wandered, and then when I was about 18, 19 years old, I came back to him. And the faith that was kind of there in my heart kind of came alive again. And it was not through any particular questions answered. It was through just a, a need for him personally. And so I came to know Christ, and I, I gave my life to Him, and I began to walk with Him. And as I grew, you know, things began to open up to me in terms of knowledge and understanding and studying the Word and reading it more. And, and I began to read uh, the Old Testament. You know, and I, as a kid, I never really read the Bible for myself, not, not too much. I knew Bible stories, but I didn't read it devotionally, personally. Uh, but as a believer, as an 18, 19, 20-year-old, I began to really dig in and read the Bible. And what I discovered and what anybody will discover is that the Old Testament prophesies clearly and distinctly thousands of years before Christ came that there would be a Messiah, that he would be born uh, a specific way. There are over 300 different specific prophecies about who the Messiah would be, how they would be, how they, their ministry would be. And so through the Old Testament, you see that he's going to be born of a virgin. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to be born of the line of David. He's going to have this type of a ministry to the poor, and he's going to preach salvation. He's going to preach the, the good news, and he's going to heal the sick, and he's going to make the dead walk you know, alive again, and the lame walk, and all the... He's going to do all these different things. He's going to die a... a sacrificial and brutal death. He's going to rise again. I mean, the Old Testament pointed to clearly, distinctly, uh, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the Old Testament uh, was closed. 400 years before he was ever born, the, the last word that God gave to a prophet, that the whole Old Testament was closed. And then you have Jesus who comes. He's the only person in history that can or ever will fulfill all these prophecies about uh, the Messiah. And so our faith is not just that I have this personal relationship with Christ, which is awesome and, and wonderful, and that's where it begins uh, for a lot of people, but it's also clearly established, confirmed, and it is given all the confidence in the world through God, revealing ahead of time, this is what's going to happen, and then it happened. And why do I say that? Uh, because in the New Testament, the most uh, clearly and profoundly uh, event that is yet to be uh, yet to occur that God is telling us about that he is prophesying over and over and over in the New Testament is the return of Christ and so God fulfilled his promises and all his prophecies of the Old Testament in the person of Christ as he came that provides salvation and forgiveness of sins. And then in the New Testament, God is pouring out revelation, uh, knowledge and understanding and prophecy about his return. And if you trust Jesus Christ personally, which uh, we encourage you if this is new to you and you haven't received Christ yet, uh, and maybe you're not sure how this works, it really is a simple thing of, of believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He paid for your sins, that you're a sinner, and that your need for Him is absolute, and you just cry out to Him. And so anybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, is what Scripture tells us. So if you call on the name of the Lord Jesus, and you ask Him to forgive your sins, and you trust Him as your Savior, then you can be as confident as anybody in the world that you are saved. And that when he returns, you will be glorified and you will inherit the same kingdom that we all believe, every believer, every Christian will inherit and enjoy for all eternity. And so we have that confidence through that personal relationship, but we also have it confirmed through all the prophecies that God laid out. In the New Testament, um, what happens is you have one, and this is mind-boggling to me, one out of every 25 verses in the New Testament say something about the return of Christ. One out of every 25 verses either mentions it, uh, it actually goes into great detail about it, uh, it alludes to it, it refers to it somehow. One out of 25 talks about the fact that Jesus Christ is going to return. 
And so why is that? Why is it so important for God to reveal to his people that he's going to bring Jesus Christ back uh, to this world to have a second coming, to uh, affirm and, and actually change the entire scope of what, what is that we're dealing with? Well, it's kind of obvious if you think about it. Uh, when I got saved, um, man, 25 years ago, that's kind of crazy to think about. Um, the, the thing that happened was that uh, I felt, you know, and I believed that, that something changed in me. My nature changed. But you know what didn't change? The world. <laughs> the world didn't change. Um, there is still, uh, and, and I still struggle, and, and every Christian does. Uh, there is still sin. There is still rebellion. There is still sickness. There is still disease. There's still war. There's still hatred. There's still crime. There's still murder. Uh, there's still kidnapping. There's still embezzling. There's still corruption. There's still uh, natural disasters. There's still pain in the world. There's still sadness, depression, anxiety, anger. I mean, you just go on and on and you look at the world around you and you say, okay, Jesus came 2,000 years ago to save the world from sin. This is God's great gospel and great message. I have come to uh, restore things back into a right relationship, to reconcile people to myself and to win people from sin into light. And this is the whole gospel. And then what happens is people get saved, and, and through the course of the last 2,000 years, billions of people have come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and have received salvation. Right now in the world, there are literally billions of people who believe in Jesus Christ as, as Lord, who trust that he is, he is the Son of God. And yet, even though Christianity is the biggest religion in the world, the world is still largely dark and lost and corrupt and broken and fallen. So what that says to us is that God's not done yet, right? He, he cannot possibly be done. He couldn't have just sent Jesus as the Savior of the world and, said, and left us in our current mess and said, oh, that's good enough for me. He couldn't possibly do that. We know that he's not done yet. He has more yet to do. And so um, he tells us in Scripture to be ready for what he's about to do. He's going to send his son back. Jesus is going to return. And the first time he came in weakness and he came in humility and he came as a baby and he came to save people from their sins. And when he returns, he's going to come in power. He's going to come in majesty. He's going to come in glory. And he's going to remove sin, sickness, illness, pain, suffering, rebellion, idolatry. He's going to remove it forever. Okay, and so here's what happens. He says, be ready. Matthew 25, 13, watch therefore. You know not neither the day nor the hour. Uh, he says in Luke 12, 40, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Uh, Luke 21, 28, now when these things began to take place or begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, he says, so then let us not sleep as others do, Okay, the world is largely asleep to the fact that, number one, that there is a God and he, this is his world. They're asleep to the fact that he's given us salvation through his son. They're asleep to the fact that he's coming back. What's scary about that is that there are a lot of Christians who seem to be asleep as well. And, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But our call from the word of God and from the spirit of God is to be ready, to always be ready. And so he says, let's not sleep like other people. This is Paul, again, in 1 Thessalonians, talking to Christian people. Let's not sleep, because there is a danger that we could as Christians. But let us keep awake and to be sober. And so here's what we sometimes miss is that it, the Bible also tells us not just to be uh, ready, uh, but also to be excited for the return of Christ. And Hebrews 9.28 says, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, Okay, or to bear sin or to pay the price for sin. He's already done that. But to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. Um, and so there's a sense of anticipation 
that uh, we're not just waiting for him to come, but we're excited for the fact that he's going to come. 2 Timothy 4.8 says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. This is Paul talking to Timothy because he's about to die and he's going to leave the mantle of his ministry to Timothy. It says, Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And I think that there's kind of a dual message there that have loved his first appearing. For those who have trusted him, we, we actually are loved the, to hear the gospel because I know that that confirms my faith and my salvation over and over, but also love and eagerly await that he's going to return again and he's going to remove all the garbage that we cannot in all of our human uh, intellect and, and modern technology and medical advancements and all the power that we can create, we cannot solve the issues of our world. Uh, vaccine's not going to do it. Only God's going to do that. Uh, we have not been able in, in the whole history of the human race been able to create a utopia. We're, we're here at, at the height of, of technology, the height of modern intellect, so to speak. And we're, in some ways, not only no better, but in a lot of ways, worse than we have been in other points in history. God has a plan, and he's going to do something he's not done yet. And so this is what he says for Christians. Uh, don't just wait and be ready, but be excited for the fact that God's got a better plan for us. And my question was, why is it that um, we're not more excited? Why is it that we're, we're a lot of people are not just... Um, not excited. They're not even hardly really waiting. And I, th I think that there are four possible reasons why people are not excited about the return of Christ. First one is uh, the cares of this world have people um, sidetracked and bogged down. There are so many things that we're busy with um, that we're, we're all about trying to do. And um, as a church, we have m tried to, over the years, minister to people uh, who are struggling with marriages. You know, where there's so many broken marriages, so many people just struggling to get along with each other in their own home. Uh, people who need help with parenting, people who need help with finances, people, you know, when we uh, do our prayer concerns, the vast majority, and I'm not down on this at all, I'm just saying that the vast majority of our prayer concerns that come in, what do you think that they are? They, and they are medical issues, they're procedures, they're health concerns, or somebody's got cancer, somebody's going in for a procedure, somebody's got you know, this issue, they want God's healing, and we're happy to pray over those things, absolutely. But what happens is we get so locked into uh, the things of this world that we forget that there's another one coming that's far better. And it distracts us from the return of our Savior. Um, some of these things are good. Some are not so good. But there's a lot of the care of this world that's going on. Uh, secondly, and this, I think, tends to be uh, much more negative, which is that we're trying to create a heaven on earth. We are, um, in t I, will, I don't want to say that we are entitled, but we, s we tend to be entitled. We feel like we deserve for things to be good. I need as much stuff as I can gather around me. I need all the money that I want to have. I want to be able to do all the things that I want to do. And we're, we are selling our soul in order to have heaven on this earth. And there are a lot of good things that, that we are blessed with in this world that God has given us families and health and jobs and, and opportunities. And, and it's not to say that any of that stuff is bad, but we tend to keep our focus on what I want out of this world instead of the fact that I'm passing through in order to get to the real goal, which is God's best for me. And so a lot of people aren't excited because they're, they're so busy trying to create a little kingdom of their own here on the earth. Um, so that's number two. Number three, I think, uh, and this is kind of across the board, there's a mystery about eternity. Uh, there's a mystery about what this is going to be like. We don't have a clear grasp of it. Uh, I think once in a while we get a, a small picture or a sense of the wonder and the awe and the glory and the goodness of what is going to happen. And we kind of have a moment where we're like, yeah, that's going to be awesome. Um, but for the most part, it's kind of hidden from us what heaven's going to really be like. And so we don't tend to get excited about stuff that we can't really understand. Uh, and so I think that is in part 
But here's the main one, and here's the one that I think, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, this is the one that I, I really, I know in my heart that keeps a lot of people from uh, being overly excited about the return of Christ, which is that we love lost people. There are people in your life that you are related to, that you're friends with, that you work with, that you know, that don't know Jesus Christ. They are not saved. They have not trusted him. And when Jesus comes, I mean, this is, this is it, okay? You have uh, the church, those who believe, those who trust Jesus. We will be glorified with him. It's going to be an awesome thing. We're, we are excited about that. But if you're not in Christ at that point, then all that is going to happen is judgment. That's it. And wrath. There's, there's no other chance. There's no other opportunity that's, that's done. And if you have anyone in your life that you care about who does not know Christ, then that's, that's the fear. That's the hesitation in your heart that says, I, I want to be excited about this, but what about all those lost people? Even if you were to say, I'm going to assume. Um, every person in this watching, listening, you know, that in the world who's a believer has somebody in their life that they know that they care about who's lost. I would, I would have to assume that. But even if you didn't, you would still have to, uh, by the Holy Spirit of God within you, care about lost people because he cares about lost people. Even if you didn't know them personally, you'd still have to say, God loves lost people. I'm supposed to love lost people too. In fact, uh, Peter says this specifically. And when he's talking about the return of Christ, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, God is not slow in keeping his promise. He is patient, not wanting anyone to perish. And so the same attitude that God has towards his world, he's patiently uh, getting the word out. He's patiently allowing for people to receive the gospel, receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He's patiently dealing with believers who are sometimes uh, a little more sleepy than they ought to be. Uh, what happens is that we also should be patiently excited. And, and this is really the whole point is that as we look forward to the return of Christ, that we have a purpose in this world. Um, and it's not just to build our little kingdom and to be comfortable and happy and safe. Our purpose is to get the gospel out as far and wide and as clearly as possible to as many people as we can, to those that we love. And uh, our testimony right now largely is uh, through social media. It's through um, long distance. We're, we're able to maybe share the gospel um, in some small ways by how we interact, but we're not interacting a lot with people personally. Um, but we do have an opportunity to let the world see through the platforms that we do have that Christ is my hope, that the gospel is where all my hope and my joy really resides. And I want people to know that, uh, that as far and wide as I can, that it is Jesus Christ that is the hope of this world. And it is my hope that more and more people will see, hear, and respond to that because the day's coming and it could be any moment. And next week uh, we will deal with like what's going to happen preceding uh, the return of Christ. And so hope you join us. Uh, but I want to pray for you that God would just begin to stir in your heart. If you don't know him, that you, that you would come to a place of faith right now. If you do know him, that he would encourage you uh, to share your faith somehow uh, with those around you. So Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity uh, to know you. You've given us that through your son, Jesus. You have provided salvation. You have forgiven our sins. You have redeemed us, restored us to yourself uh, through faith in Christ, through the power of the, the sacrifice on the cross. And Lord, we praise you for that. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would stir in people's hearts to remind them uh, or even just to share with them for the first time that, that salvation is an awesome gift and it only has to be received doesn't have to be earned, doesn't have to be paid for, it's already been paid for. Uh, you've given it to us freely, and by your grace, Lord, we can receive it through faith, and we pray that more and more people would. Lord, I pray for your church, I pray for your people, wherever they may be, God, that you would bless them with uh, a new heart uh, for lost people. Uh, but not only that, God, but as we think about those around us who need to see, hear, and understand the power of Christ, uh, that we would also point people to uh, the fact that you have greater things. 
in store for us, Lord. Our time on this earth should be spent purposely, uh, but also hopefully because of the things that you have promised us for eternity. And so we give you praise and glory and thanks, and we ask you to do all in your will and all in your heart for us in Jesus' name. Amen.